Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Each week while working on the new album, the Dead Milkman ask each other a question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a weird holiday. I mean, Thanksgiving tradition for that now that you know he's he's passed away and just goes to visits homes on Thanksgiving and and demands Manischewitz. We yeah. just it's just so weird. But you know, I think Americans have adapted to it, and I just think that shows the coming togetherness of of Americans that we would allow dead Prince Philip into our home to drink Manischewitz. All right, so I will now. We've allowed it to evolve. The things we've allowed it to evolve. Yeah, I mean, it's only really the first year of it, but it, it, I think it will evolve into something even greater eventually. Maybe the late Prince Philip smoking a bowl in your living room while he watches the Macy's parade. I guess you know because he was in and out of our house this year. All right, I better get to the to tonight's topic. I imagine. All right, tonight is unsung heroes of punk rock. We're finally going to give credit where credit is due. Uh, tonight's question is basically, what musician or group of musicians has never received their proper accolades for their contribution to punk rock? Now, you get bonus points if you can name a non-musician, like me, or a group of non-musicians, us, um, that has con- uh, never received the proper accolades for their contribution to punk rock. You got it in the first part. Okay, so I'm going to go first because it's my question. And originally, I was going to go with Tina Wymouth from the Talking Heads. Uh, and then Joe and I were, were discussing it uh, while we were in the recording studio. And Joe was like, not punk, new wave, totally different head. I didn't totally say different. that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but he also did point out that Tina Wymouth was kind of famous. I didn't want to do that because we were probably, although she's done some great things, it would have probably uh, turned into like 10 minutes of me bashing David Byrne for taking credit for a lot of the things that, that Tina had done. So instead, I decided to go uh, kind of obscure, and I'm going to go with a band that existed from, I think, like the very early 80s to the very early 90s, and that was a band called Rat At Rat R. And they played here in Philly fairly regularly. They were originally from Philly, and then they moved to New York. People don't do that. If you're from Philly, don't don't move don't move your band to New York. It's not it's not going to help. It's not good. And uh, and also if you if you're in a band in New York, don't come to Philly. We we're good. We're fine. Um, but they were to describe them. They were sort of a noise band. A sort of like, sometimes they call them an art band. Like the uh, the young lady who played bass would would beat the bass with a drumstick. They were Sonic Youth, but better. I really, I really say they were, you know, there's always the, the band that makes it big and then the band that's kind of like them that should have made it big for the same reason that if there was going to be a huge punk rock trio, it shouldn't have been Nirvana. It should have been Killdozer. And this is the same sort of thing. They were really, really good. We, we'd see them live quite frequently and they were riveting. Uh, there are, I'll put up links. There are some uh, links. Some of their old stuff is up on YouTube, but they really should have been big. And I really felt bad that they weren't. And a lot of people, when you saw them, it made you want to make a lot of noisy, uh, loud, scary music. So Rat At, Rat R out of New York. And if they ever see this, boy, I I, I hope they say, hey, maybe we should get back together and, and work on that band some more. This is really good. Okay. Now, as for a group of non-musicians, I'm going for the bonus points here. And I thought somebody will probably pick John Waters. So I went with the other great non-musician contributor to the world of punk rock, the Weekly World News. <laughs> the Weekly World News was amazing. It existed as a print magazine from, uh, I think, like 1979. So you can see the beginning of punk here uh, and all the way up to 2007. And I just want to say, mm, I'm choking on something. I just want to say that not... Everybody who read the Weekly World News was a punk, but every punk read the Weekly World News. It gave us Bat Boy. It gave us Ed Anger, who would get pig biting mad. It gave us the greatest advice column of all time, Dear Dottie, which is like this crossword too. It's a big one. The crossword, crossword. was amazing. Um, it was it was you. It was normally folks like fake stories, like Bat Boy or aliens or Elvis sightings. But occasionally they would throw in a real story. And we found when we were sitting around the table once in an uh, old place, and uh, everybody's reading the Weekly World News, and there was a woman in there from Philadelphia who had stolen, I think, the candy money for her daughter's school thing, and they had her name in there. So we just looked her up in the yellow page, in the white pages, and called her like, "Hey, do you know you're in the Weekly World News?" And she. 
she wasn't thrilled. Um, if uh, it made its way into popular culture, so if you see Repo Man, the cover of a Weekly World News thing is splashed there. Men in Black, which I've never seen, but apparently that's how they get all their orders as to where to go. They're like, check out, you know, the news, page 27. Um, it, uh, David Byrne actually used uh, um, the Weekly World News as his uh, driving force or plot behind true stories. Unless we find out he stole that entire idea from Tina Weyman, and that's entirely possible, considering <laughs> what I've learned lately. So it's really, really good. I think we need to bring back the term pig biting mad. I think maybe there should be a song on the next album called Big Biting Mad. Now, if you miss the Weekly World News, they don't have it in print anymore, sadly, but they have a website. And as Marcus Parks from last podcast on Left pointed out, they've still got it. The website is freaking fantastic. I'm going to give you, here's a headline from the latest online edition of the Weekly World News. Cheapo genealogy site tells man that he's descended from his mother. Yes, yes, it's still good. It's still good. Uh, a while back, the uh, um, I think it was the, I can't remember, I imagine it was, because it's 2010 when this happened, the, uh, uh, so it would have been the online site. Um, they put up a story saying that the LAPD uh, decided to buy 100 jetpacks, and lo and behold, the people on Fox and Friends believed them. So, and I know fooling Fox and Friends, that, that doesn't take a lot of work. But I'm just so happy that the Weekly World News is still out there and it still exists. So uh, my two unsung heroes of punk rock are Rat at Rat R, an incredible band that I think was a little bit better than Sonic Youth. And uh, also the Weekly World News. So now we shall move to Joseph. I choose... <laughs> for the underrated or unsung influences, influences of punk. Uh, four guys from Indiana, West Lafayette, Indiana. Greg Horn, Chris Clark, Tim North, and Brad Garten, also known as Mr. Science, who in 1979 formed a band called Gal Jones and the Industrials. They they didn't put out too many. They, they had a split with a band called the Gizmos. They had a seven inch self-titled and uh, they also appeared on a compilation called Can't Stand the Midwest. I think their most famous song, Can't Stand the Midwest, covered by Yula Tango and others. And uh, the reason I picked them is Dave Blood cites them as the reason for playing the bass in the first place. And he's he influenced us, of course, by being our bass player. So there you go. They have a lineage to us. And they they also, I'm, I'm sure they influenced a lot of other people. I'm, I think they influenced the Zero Boys, who went on to influence a bunch of other punk bands. Another band that didn't put out a whole lot of music but still had a lot of influence from one one album called vicious circle which is still i think being pressed up by some company probably <laughs> so uh yeah not many i don't think a whole lot of people know gal jones and the industrials but more people should you have a non-musician um yeah us the dead milkman <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say Ronald Reagan, actually, as my non-musician. <laughs> but then I decided I didn't think he should have hero status. But my reasoning <laughs> was that um, he influenced by his policies, uh, his racist racism and his conservatism, influenced a lot of punk bands, probably, <laughs> uh, to oppose it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue with here because I okay. would say, point out that during World War II, uh, Ronald Reagan bravely defended the bar, the Brown Derby, against attack from the Japanese. He's been there. He bravely held out and stayed there. Hey, Joe, by the way, um, the, you mentioned the Gizmos. Uh, Pre-COVID, um, I, I caught a band down in FDR Park and uh, called, uh, from Philly called Total Wine. That's W-H-I-N-E. And uh, um, they um, did a cover of a Gizmo song. And they're all in the late teens, very early 20s. Like, oh, wow. How do you know that how how would you know so maybe, maybe they have a wider influence than i imagine they have but just I, I, I think total wine just have like a good radar going i yeah, think they yeah. pick up you need to see that band really good i'll check them out okay so i believe dan is next yeah 
I um <clears throat> I chose for musician that was an unsung hero of punk rock, uh, Screamin' Jay Hawkins, because he just, I know I've talked about him before in this, I think I recommended that documentary, which I still recommend. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I just jotted down notes and I, I didn't even get enough. <laughs> I, it, it was just, he was apparently, he was adopted by Blackfoot Native Americans and he studied classical piano then he started playing guitar and he told his um he told his music tutor you better leave or leave before i make your life miserable with what i want to play um i've got all the information i need from you to do what i want <laughs> uh so you might want to leave before you get miserable um he, he he apparently wanted to be an opera singer at some point he joined the army at 13 cuz he forged a birth certificate and I think I'd mentioned it in another one of these about how he was captured in a POW camp in Japan. And like when he went, when he was freed, he went and found the guy that captured him and like tortured him. Anyway, but into his music career, he was apparently really drunk when he recorded uh, I Put a Spell on You with all the grunts and stuff. And he didn't really remember it. Um, <clears throat> there's a great uh, clip where he's on the Merv Griffin show, I think in 1965 or six. And I thought there was footage of him in the Alan Freed thing. Um, I, I I didn't do that extensive of a search, but I didn't see anything. Um, but that's where he comes out of the coffin. He's wearing like a gold leopard print. Um, <clears throat> and then apparently at some point, you know, he got burned by one of his props in 1976. So he got like damage to his face. Um, <clears throat> he had stuff like uh, smoking skulls and like rubber snakes. Uh, and then in the 80s, he was, like, playing in piano bars and, like, doing requests and stuff. And a guy from the Fuzz Tones found him and, like, had him do some music with them. And then in, like, the 90s, he put out some music. He covered a Tom Waits song. And he had an album called Black Music for White People. <laughs> um, and he did Whistling Past the Graveyard, uh, which we did a, a show before, a Halloween show. Um, he apparently toured with Nick Cave in The Clash at some point. He was married six times. He had between 57 and 75 children. There's actually a website Chase kids. that is used to trace the children of him. And he died on February 12th, 2000. And the reason that I think he's punk as fuck is because he didn't give a shit. And it actually made his image, like, much cooler. And apparently he kind of resented the whole, like, image of being screaming Jay and stuff. But... <clears throat> but he still went with it and he did whatever, you know, he, he just always played music. He was in piano bars at some point. He just, just kept doing it and he did what he wanted. And like, he learned the basics and was like, he said to his music tutor, like, all right, I got all the information I need. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not to mention the fact that he's African American too, and doing this in the fifties and, you know, that's a whole other thing. But, and then as far as non-musician, um, which I guess this counts, but uh, Andy Kaufman or Kaufman, whatever, um, <clears throat> who was also Tony Clifton, who was kind of a musician. So I don't know. Um, but I just I I don't I can't get enough of just lo randomly looking up clips of him on David Letterman or uh, or the clips from Fridays or SNL. Um, <clears throat> I mean, he's truly somebody that did not give a fuck. Like he. In these some of these interviews, there's one with David Letterman where he's got like snot coming out of his nose. He's talking about how his wife left him, and people are laughing. He's like, "Why are you laughing? Is that funny?" Um, I just love. I I don't know. To me, that's I guess what like like real like punk is, where like they they just mess with stuff. If you break up with somebody, because that person that you're dating is maybe the one that you really really want, and if you wait one day, they'll be taken by somebody else. So you have to move. You can't procrastinate. I've missed opportunities. They mess with people's heads too, like kind of challenge things and have people be like, I've never seen anything like this. Do I like it? I don't know. It's outrageous though. <laughs> Screaming yeah. Jay Hawkins had so many children that in the next coming century, there will probably be a Screaming Jay Hawkins genome. There, there is currently, a, <laughs> there's a Genghis Khan genome. 
Genghis Khan has so many children that I think like one out of five men in, in Asia can trace their ancestry to Genghis Khan. And they're saying it's quite possible that when they do the genome things, they will look for the Screaming Jay Hawking genome because he's had so many children. Children, they, they, it's I think it's up over 100 now. If you're a child of Screaming Jay Hawkins or a descendant of him, please put it in the comments. Uh, the, the, the site Finding Jay's Kids is amazing. Yeah. I, I thought of a good name for a band, Dreamin' Steve Hawkins. So it's like Stephen Hawking's, but it's like Screamin' Jay. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I put Anybody a spell heard, on you. Heard that wants to take that, go ahead. I put a spell on you because you're time. <laughs> it's relative. Yeah, eight physicists just laughed at that. <laughs> I don't know if we have eight physicists that watch this show, but it's quite possible. I've looked at our statistics. Brian May watches this, you know. Yeah, Brian, uh, well, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> astrophysicist Brian May, we salute you if you're watching. There, there's a musician turned something else, or I guess he always was a, a physicist, right? Or something. He's a wizard. That His guitar, he carved out of an old piece <laughs> of wood. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? It, 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 it's... If he would just be glad he went into music, otherwise he would have enslaved us all. We'd all be like, we all have, there'd be a big statue of Brian May behind me. Before we start tonight, let us praise Brian May. <laughs> um, all right, are you all right? If, if, if Dan, if you're finished up, then we'll move on. Yeah, I'm to good. That's it. All right. Well, I think I misunderstood the question a little bit, so I'm gonna. I, I don't have a punk rock musician, but I, I jump straight to the bonus points. Oh, um, so sorry about that. That's um, okay. Uh, my bonus point punk rocker is uh, Marcel Duchamp. Um, oh. So he's a French, he was a French painter, sculptor, and his work is associated with Dadaism and Cubism and conceptual art. Um, he has a whole room of his own at the Philadelphia Museum. Um, he's recorded uh, along with Picasso and, and Matisse is one of the three artists responsible for significant developments in painting and sculpture in the opening decades of the 20th century. Um, so he has a number of pieces, a number of his most important pieces are at the Philadelphia Art Museum, which I always make a point of going to his room when, when, I, when we go. Um, one is uh, the new Descending Staircase number two, which is, I believe, the first Cubist painting. Um, it just shocked everybody when it came out. Um, and the other one there that's pretty amazing is a giant, uh, it's like a, a sculpture, uh, it's like glass with paint. Um, it's called, I, forgive my French, Etan Donnet. Um, it's a sort of a stylized picture of a chocolate grinder and it's like painted and, and it's got different kinds of things between glass. And the cool thing about it is um, when it was shown earlier in the century, it was being shipped and it was in a truck and it went over a bump and the glass cracked. And when they pulled it out for the next showing or whatever, they 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 called up Duchamp and said, hey, uh, we're really sorry your artwork got damaged in shipping. And he was like, hey, that's pretty cool. I'm just gonna roll with that. That's great. <laughs> so um, if you go to the museum now, you can see it. It's got all kinds of cracks in the glass and everything. He just kind of embraced uh, whatever happened to it. Um, of course, one of his other uh, Dadaist sculptures is called uh, Fountain. And uh, it's signed R. Mutt. And basically it's a men's urinal, urinal turned on its side. Um, I, I was recently informed that there is some controversy about this piece because he might have submitted it um, for a fellow artist who happened to be a woman and was not able to enter a uh, competition in France somewhere. So you can do your own research on that. But uh, is there the Armut is Armut. I forget. I forget the name where the name came from. Yeah. There are several copies of it. I think the original was actually lost, and yeah. so he made made copies of it. I mean. So, you know, he did what whatever he wanted. I think at one point he just stopped making art and he played chess for 25 years. He had the little pocket chess thing. You can see it at the museum. Yeah. Ryan Eno, who we mentioned in the last episode, got drunk once at the Met where the R. Mutt urinal is and pissed in it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dean, you failed to mention my favorite piece of his at the... Uh, um, the uh, one through the, the door? Party. The one where you get to take a little peek yeah, in. Yeah, you know what? Door. I'm thinking now that I got it wrong. I think that might be the attack 
a yeah. top down. Yeah, like, there is a special little dark corner of the room where you have to walk in, and there's a double doors, and there's two little eye holes, and you peek in. That is, I believe, his last piece of art, and nobody knew that he was working on it. Um, there's a video out there. I'm going to try and find a link for you all. Um, there's like a link of him like hanging out in the room, sitting yeah. in an easy chair, smoking cigars, and like he considered it like his second home. Uh, in the Philadelphia Art Museum for a while. So it's, anyway, it's, that's my uh, non-musician punk rock. I watched an entire documentary once about Duchamp, made from made from uh, I think the Metropolitan Museum of Art, made in New York, and with with you know references to Paris and everything. Not one reference to Philadelphia. They would <laughs> show the artwork. It was the most. In fact, uh, the the song I turned in, uh, New York Guide to Art, was a little jab at, at this. Um, the uh, um, the they they were they were basically they show new descending the staircase but then they kind of act like it was in New York it was you know in a museum in New York and I'm like this is not cool not cool at all a lot of people do not know we have uh, people I was in there one time when somebody freaked out seeing new descending the staircase like oh my god it's here it's like people visiting and they're like they they had no idea if that's where it was. Yeah, he had a little pocket chess thing. He really liked chess so much at, uh, in the museum. They have a little pocket chess game that he invented. But whenever I do something goofy uh, and and people just stare at me, I always go, "Oh, if Duchamp had done it, you'd be like, yeah." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, funny. that's my answer. I'm sorry I missed out on the punk rock part of it. That's okay. We just you know I, I think it was good anyway. And it's uh, again you know you you start to think about wait a minute when did punk begin? You know what I'm saying? Like, when did you? It's hard to figure out, like, who were, because you start going back and you start finding wise asses. I think they should have, like, you know, wise asses influence on punk rock. I, and my nobody, runner up band was the Kinks, because, like, I feel like <clears throat> they, you know, they had distorted guitar and they were, like, not singing. They were singing about, like, love and stuff, but they weren't always singing about it. It was, like, not like the Beatles. And their voices were kind of like, scratch you i don't know i always said the kinks didn't get you know considered as like a pre-punk proto-punk i will never forgive them for superman the <laughs> song whining about tax man what the kinks would the kinks would play uh, um like a, a department store opening you know what i mean they're 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 just one step away from being that was the late out. 70s kinks that's a totally yeah, they, 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 the style. early kinks is much better yeah. or the 80s kinks King Kong the low budget <laughs> kinks you're thinking of of of, of Kingston Starship, I think. <laughs> Happy it's Life Day, by the way, everybody. Happy Life Day. The, um, the trio. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're, let's move on now. And I'm sure everybody watching this is glad we're moving on. <laughs> let's move on to recommendations. So my first recommendation, I just want to say for everybody who saw and I talked last week about the new D about the DX7, um, I have replaced the internal battery. And I have also replaced the um, battery in this cartridge. So I basically have my setup from the 80s, which everybody is pleased about except Joe. was a lot of the sounds he didn't like. <laughs> um, they, but Joe, I will be putting into this the Joe sound. So you'll be, you'll be happy. There is a, the sound from, um, oh, from if you love somebody set them on fire, it's named after Joe. Now, um, so that is all set up. I've customized it. So when you fire it up, it, it gives my name and all that. The last step will be to add a gritty sticker. And then once I do, it's it's totally 100% there. I filmed the whole thing, uh, me replacing and going inside. That was the first one to open it up in 34 years. So I will, that might appear maybe over on my channel or something. If you're, if you ever feel like replacing the battery inside of DX11, but I might do a whole history of the, the thing. Who knows? All right. So now that that's not technically a recommendation because you don't have one of these laying around but uh for my recommendation because it's you're watching this a few days after thanksgiving i'm going to recommend from 1970 it's a tv movie called crowhaven farm uh crowhaven farm is absolutely amazing it stars hope lang as this woman named maggie so maggie inherits a farm it's quite possible this is where bob dylan came up with the idea for i ain't going to work on maggie's farm no more uh, in fact i'm just going to say that bob dylan stole the idea yeah, or I ain't gonna work on Maggie's farm. No he more. got it from Tina Weymouth, you know. From, 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 from Farm and Tina Weymouth, yes. Um, and um, 
it's also got John Carradine in it explaining what a handyman is, which is great. I'm a handyman. I'm starting to look like John Carradine. I'm a handyman. You know, I should general fix her up. And I'm like, thanks for explaining that because, you know, like, I'm a doctor. I generally I do work on inside of people. It's just, I'm a lawyer. I do lawyering things. It's just so weird. Um, and it, it, I'm glad he does explain it to Hope Lang because her and her husband uh, in this film, her husband Ben, are not portrayed as the smartest individuals, and they can't have children. And I think that's because nobody's ever explained sex to them. <laughs> I think John Carradine explaining sex to them would be awesome. Um, and there are a lot of flaws with it. Basically, um, this you know Massachusetts in this looks like the area just outside of Sacramento, as everything did in 1970s TV movies. Um, it, it's also, um, I want to point out, because it is right after uh, Thanksgiving, th these are Puritans in this movie, not pilgrims. Pilgrims came to America seeking freedom from oppression, and Puritans came here seeking the freedom to oppress. Just so you know, if anybody ever asks you the difference between the two, that's it right there. Pilgrims want to break away from the Church of England, and pilgrims uh, and, uh, pilgrims want to break away from the Church of England. Puritans wanted to reform it and make it even stricter. They used to do things like hang Quakers. So, uh, yeah, just heavily, heavily recommend to you. Uh, spend It'll become a Thanksgiving tradition for you as it is for me and my family. Now for uh, music recommendation this time. Uh, I used to work with a, uh, uh, musically with a, a really talented young lady named Jen Bix. And uh, I think uh, because she was so talented, they won't work with me. No, just, uh, no, she's super nice, super great. And years ago, her and uh, um, Dirk Ivins, who is the guy who's done everything, uh, released a, a double sided thing, a double sided single. That would make sense. Yeah. And it's called Fuck, Rinse, Repeat. And the B side was Burn. And it was fantastic. I was like, my God, I can't wait till people get to hear it. And it's set in limbo for so long. Finally, Ant Zen Records has released it. So we'll put up a link. Go listen to it. It is really, really good. It's excellent, minimalist, grinding synth uh, music. Jen's voice is in top form. And again, she's a super great person. So if you could go and get a hold of this, I think you will really, really enjoy it. Again, it's Fuck, Rinse, rinse Repeat, Beside It with Burn. So please, please check that one out, people. For anybody who's interested in politics and history, especially of the 1970s, I will recommend this book called Reaganland <laughs> by Rick Perlstein or Perlstein. Um, if you have some extra time, it's pretty. The door stops. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, it's he's, a door he's getting tired but... lifting it. He's, like, he's building up biceps. Do some, do some curls with it. <laughs> <laughs> but it covers uh, Reg Ronald Reagan's rise in politics during the late 1970s while Jimmy Carter is president. And it's fascinating. It's written in with excruciating detail. Does it talk Almost about the Black Dahlia? Huh? <laughs> murdering the black dahlia the, um, there's no mention of the any black dahlia in here but um it did take me a while to read it but i will say i'm happy i did um yeah if you want a good companion book well, joe have you ever read ronald reagan's diaries i <laughs> maybe it would be good with ronald reagan's diaries which i have not read the diaries kind of but pick I'm up sure after he's president. Read them. It what? is a train wreck. Uh, a lot of it is redacted. Every it'll say like Ron Jr. called and redacted because I guess Ron Jr. is calling. Um, him, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, and yeah, and well, a lot of it, he he gets angry because he goes. He went to Japan and everything was in Japanese, and the only thing that wasn't in Japanese was. Um, uh, was was uh, was CNN. But he didn't want to watch the news, and he was so happy he found a show in English. It was heart to heart. It was just. Yes, it is. If you're reading this thing, it's really scary that this guy had his finger on the button. Uh, so, yeah, and they actually oh, changed, yeah. they changed the nuclear code to 0000 for him so he could remember it. It's, oh, it's nice to the, know. The book is a great, yeah. His, so His book stops at his inauguration, so we yeah. don't get into that. But Mr. Perlstein is obviously not a Reagan fan. So, <laughs> if, yeah. It's going to be a good read. <laughs> <laughs> so the, but it's enlightening. I found it to be enlightening. It's in, like, like, in in a way it explains the Republican Party even as they are today. Yeah. The idea, the idea of the and we've talked about it on here before, yeah. the social things versus yeah. And you'll see so, if you read it, you'll probably immediately see parallels to 
Donald Trump's uh, campaign style and his political style. Only Donald Trump is a lot more vulgar. Oh, Joe, is that the end of your recommendations? That's all I'm recommending. Okay. All right. Well, I'm I, saying I add, really after, after you read that, read a Yes, sir. I'm just going to say, just write in a journal. Like, I have this small one. And uh, just do that. Because uh, then you can look back and be like, oh, that's what I said then. I know we'll you have your... It because uh, I think, you know, burning it is helpful in the fall. Mm. Equinox. I like in your journal how it talks about when we were in Japan and you couldn't find any English language TV. And then Heart to Heart was on. I remember you were so happy. You came running down. Heart to Heart is on. <clears throat> so your turn, Dean. Uh, I'm going to recommend uh, something related to my uh, answer to the question, which is please come to Philadelphia. Please go to one of the uh, most renowned mu art museums in the world, world the class art museum. museum. Art. Um, and make a pilgrimage to the Marcel Duchamp room and check out uh, the artwork there. There's lots to see. Um, right now, I haven't been yet, but there's the, um, what is it, the Jasper John show I want to get to. I, I saw it went through once many, many years ago, and they had the Jasper John, uh, the shoes with the shoe mirrors on them. <laughs> so you could look up a dress. Yeah, Jasper. Yeah, uh, uh, definitely do. It. I mean, we 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 talked about Cy Tumbley's. Oh yeah, there's the the artwork, last yeah. Week. It's there, but there's still a lot of great stuff. The armor room is incredible. There's a uh, a sword there with a pistol attached to it. So if you weren't that good with sword play, you had a way out. Um, it is a. While you're here, also the Rosenbach Museum doesn't get enough love. Um, a lot of people don't know that Bram Stoker came up with the idea for the novel Dracula. While he was here in Philadelphia, staying at the Bellevue Stratford, the Rosenbach Museum has all of his original notes for Dracula, where he's playing around with names and, and he's adding little things in there. And it's also got the manuscript for James Joyce's Ulysses. And every year on Bloom Day, which I believe is June 16th, Bloom's Day, um, people come outside the Rosenbach and they read a chapter from Ulysses. It's always been a, a dream of mine to do that. Uh, it's really, really good. I think when I might have been Rendell was mayor. I'm trying to remember who was mayor, and he was reading from it uh, outside there. And I thought, wow, this book used to be banned, and now the mayor reads from it out loud. So the uh, yeah, the Rosenbach, we have tons. Seriously, he's right. Come to Philadelphia. I mean, it's just one little hidden gem right after another. Constitution Center is fantastic. Everything here is, uh, um, it's like the gods reached down and said, this place shall be special. So, okay. Well, I think that's the end of today's show. Uh, does anyone have anything they'd like to add or anything like that? No. All right, everybody. Uh, yeah, we, we, we're, all a little, we're all a little filled with turkey for Thanksgiving. So. say goodbye now what were you flashing on there joe are you, are you, oh yay 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 gritty, you gritty, had a sticker gritty, i have gritty, one gritty too. gritty 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 get it remember fuck around and find out another great thing about philadelphia <laughs> Bye.